Hi, I'm Ryan P. Carey DDS, <laughs> and I suffer from a terminal case of the creative impulse. <laughs> This is Jerry. This is Lane. This is Dave. And you are listening to the Creative Impulse Podcast. Motivates you. Can you talk about some of what motivates you to be a co- to be a comedian, and also, or first and foremost, to write about comedy, and then secondly, to actually. Uh, perform comedy well that's the big question isn't it is incentive um so the incentive to write about comedy uh right now is that i just have experience with it it's much easier to write journalism with a funny voice than it is to be funny on stage i mean stand-up comedy is probably the hardest thing ever you know what i mean and that's one of the reasons i stopped doing it is because i really it's so hard and it requires so much uh, mental and emotional work and such a swallowing of your dignity fairly often that I just didn't really... I, I was doing okay at it, but you know, I was getting laughs, but I, I was repeating myself. And then if you want to like expand your writing, like your, expand what you're doing in any meaningful way, you have to like triple your work. I don't... I, I wasn't really getting the incentive to really... Especially when I realized I probably wasn't going to move to New York to try and be a comedy writer, you know. <laughs> but but what makes uh, comedy so hard is the vulnerability. Uh, to do it well, you have to really be at, out there. You're exposing yourself, or else people, you know, an audience can read that you're not being honest with them. That uh-huh. you're using a facade. I mean, how long can that can that last? Authenticity uh, does do a lot better, like you say. Um, the funny thing, though, and I don't think. That a lot of, you know, I think, Lane, you you listen to comedy podcasts from time to time. I do. I know a lot of my friends like to nerd out about the philosophy of comedy. So at the end of the day, um, and again, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to be nihilistic about this. Um, there is certainly um, times where authentic moments on stage are more valuable and you get, the audience gives you an easier time. Um, but at the outset, you really don't have to be yourself you could be a character that you don't relate to so you know the uh, method acting of the united states it's really just a way to stay incredibly focused and committed and uh, concentrated it's a way to kind of shut everything else out and to uh, prioritize what's important that's really another way to describe going method I say the United States, but like it was invented here. But I, you know, Robert De Niro and all these guys, they would get into their characters. Uh, Daniel Day Lewis. I drink your milkshake. They would become their characters so that when they were on screen, they would be authentic. So the British tradition was more of uh, Lawrence Olivier would would try not to. He would do the opposite of that. Oh no! It's I who should be ashamed of my arrogance my stupid pride of all except one thing one thing i'm not ashamed of having loved you and and i i apologize i don't have too much more background on what that means like he would he would try to block thinking about his character out of his mind when he wasn't on stage i i I forget where i read this and i encourage you guys to look it up and possibly call me out for being ill-informed but I know, like the British actors Burton and like these other like greats, would like attempt to just like be them totally and utterly themselves off camera until the second they yelled action, and then they would try and like dive in real quickly. And I think that was like a, you know, that could be seen as a less. I I don't know which is you would think that the American way becomes more authentic. Um, but at the end of the day, here's what people don't realize is you just need to deliver uh, something that people aren't expecting and it makes them laugh. So you say like, well, no, duh. But at, like you get some comedians that really don't have to be themselves. Like uh, who's the guy uh, um, with the the nursery rhymes? Um, uh, Andrew Dice Clay. Andrew, Andrew Dice Clay was said to have been in a character for, like, whole albums. What's in the bowl, bitch? Oh! And 
you know, it was kind of like this brash, you know, Jersey esque, you know, just you know, vulgar type of guy. There was this album, The Day the Comedy Died, or The Day the Laughter Died, I think. And this is uh, said to have been done like in character. And so it occurs to you like a lot of people like this guy, right? And a lot of people hate this guy. That's the thing you got to remember. The, Andrew Dice Clay cleaned up during his time. You know what I mean? There's no doubt about it. I mean, you could argue that it doesn't age well or whatever. Um, and it's more so that if today's tastes have probably changed. But regardless, he made stadiums of people laugh. So the question is, is he being himself? Like, is that him, his personality? Or is that a character, you know, he's sat satirizing the guys that were like at the, you know, the roofers from next door that he overheard with a vulgar mouth talking about women as they walked by or whatever. Th that's probably true, but he probably is also injecting a part of himself into it. Well, here's at the end of the day, here's that's the, the kernel of authenticity. Yeah, he was, he was a, from what I understand, he was originally like a nerdy guy, and that didn't really pan out, right. like the, the nerd character. So he then he tried the, he tried like the, uh, the, the tough guy character or whatever you would call him. In, in comedy, people like confidence. And this is, um, at the risk of ruining my reputation entirely, you see a difference in uh, black clubs and white clubs. So uh, for one reason or another, black audiences relate to comedy that is more sure of itself, mm -hmm. um, more confident. White audiences relate to self-deprecating Louis C.K. I'm a piece of shit at the end of the day. Yeah, I'm not a good guy. I am not. A, you know, I wish I was a this good guy. Is like, you know, really prevalent. This is like everywhere you look. I mean, this is, you know, but you. But are you saying Louis C.K. That's the illusion of authenticity? Shit just got real. No, yeah. it sounds like no, something. No, you're, something, something you're saying something youngy and it's or something because you're talking about gr broader. Uh, Groups of people, as opposed to an, an, an individual, there's something you're you're tapping into some sort of collective consciousness. Then it sounds like <laughs> I don't want to speculate about the 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 macro psychology of this, but I do know that it seems like it. The point I'm making is that it seems like it doesn't really matter if you just have to seem to be authentic. You know so what is I mean? there is there a formula? Perhaps is there to a comedy? Formula? Yeah, there's a formula. Yeah, there, there's uh, a, I, I, I was reading a book. They said there's a there's a formula, which is called the threes. Have you noticed? In punchlines, it's always the rule of three. T uh, target, hostility, re realism, um, emotion, exaggeration, and surprise. You could totally use formula and get laughs. No question. I mean, I think what Lane's talking about is like people that are, you know, more savvy audiences don't really let that fly for too much longer. I'm talking about oh. longevity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, right, okay. So, yeah, w so what Jerry's talking about is anyone could get laughs at an open mic, you know what I mean? But what makes... So, to answer your question, yeah, authenticity does make for a sustainable career in comedy because without, without that, you would be hard-pressed. You would have to be an absolute psychopath mm -hmm. to have, you know, Larry the Cable Guy. For example, like Larry the Cable Guy, as you guys know, is like a fairly intelligent, like college graduate. He's like he went to some good school. And he lecture, what the hell? He doesn't talk. He doesn't talk like that, and and his jokes are about how dumb he is. You know, this is a variation of a conversation we've had about well, like NWA with Ice Cube. What is his actual background? Right, from a more middle class pre-engineering. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot of these guys, because they're they're like a lot of rappers and so forth, are classically trained musicians, and they and it's and, and like any and and it's you know they're it's it's like any other form of music or expression. It takes it takes training and, and time to develop. Yeah. So to speak about it more nihilistically, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's real or not. It's about the presentation. You know, the lie is love. Love the lie. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's like you know embrace the lie yeah yeah absolutely i mean that's what that's what theater is about you know any type of uh, artistic performance is about taking you out of your your you know and that's why for the record um uh theater comedy i'm doing air quotes theater comedy versus club comedy theater comedy gets away with so much more and i think in a good way because the audience is there to like sit quietly and try and have some type of meaningful uh, intellectualization of the real world, you know what I mean. Whereas in in clubs, they just want to see you can make fun of some guy's shirt, you know what I mean. So like, that's why in in theater comedies, you know, theater theater comedy, the audience sits quietly and they let 
long periods without jokey jokes go in order for the comic to build a point, you know, and build to a point. And so theater com and and that's more popular, and I'm I'm excited about that because there is certainly more anth- authenticity there. And I've tried in theaters doing my club jokes, you know, just like the quick, like easy kind of like you know the dick jokes that like get easy laughs at the comedy club. They they kind of go wah wah. They don't go over well because it's like yeah, it's technically funny, but it's not particularly meaningful to like you know it's not anything that they haven't really heard before, you know. So, but yeah, you're right though about authenticity. I mean, at the end of the day, that's why Louis C.K. is like Louis C.K. has like you know his his umpteenth award winning hour. You know what is it? Here's a larger a question, a broader yeah. question for everybody: is what does it take to be authentic? That kind of ties into what we were talking about something earlier. Like, how do you? You know, I try to put a lot of authenticity into the work I produce, and uh-huh. it, it takes a lot of you know, self refle- self reflection and a lot of agonizing. Is that you know how does that you know how do you get to that place where you can do that? Are your influences interfering with your ability to express yourself in an authentic and independent way? No, I would say not. Not in my case. Uh, I would say that. You know, in fact, when I, I I would say that a lot of the uh, the artists I use for for influence are they're liberators, especially now. Earlier on, I was you know I would there were artists who I look at who I copied and I emulated, but now. When I see an artist who's doing something I really like, I don't emulate their style, but there's but seeing what they're doing frees me to frees myself, it frees my it frees me to to, to explore in ways. I'd say, well, hey, they they're opening, they've they've gone deep and they're opening up, so I'm going to do the same thing. And I have to, and I ma- com- comedians, it's the same thing with comedians. Yeah. They're they're going to some, so they're, so often they're going to some dark places or some some deep places with today. Themselves. Yeah, that's where it's going more often. Well, you think more so? It, it yeah. wasn't that way in the past. That's um, what Charlie Chaplin was doing, or. You know, yeah, well, Richard Pryor. A pri- well, Pryor was going to some dark yeah. places. Yeah. yeah, I and those guys were fairly monolithic, you know, mm-hmm. for their time for, for sure. But you know, the average, the Carl average Carlin. comedy yeah. club jokey jokester, you know, was you know, today it's more. I think that's more prevalent in the comedy scene. Mm-hmm. Is is this type of you know self discovery, putting yourself, uh, putting putting your inner person on on display for everyone to see. This, this we're, in a, we're in a period of like deconstructing things. The philosophy of deconstructionism says meaning depends on the materials used to express it, and the materials are always already contradictory. The formula of comedy is that, you know, one of the biggest formulas of comedy is you have to make a connection to something else that the other peop- that the audience didn't expect. You know, my wife reminds me of like, uh, the, you know, Hillary Clinton because, and then you just come up with something that Hillary Clinton does that we all know that she does, mm-hmm. and something that your wife does that we all get that she would do, and make that connection. And if it's like, if it's kind of unexpected enough, but but is correct, but works technically, then you get laughs. You know what I mean? So the deconstruction is is really, I think, playing on that same per- portion of the brain that likes to identify. Target acquired, you know, I get it more now. You know, this is, I didn't expect this to be the reason that this is like this. Or I didn't. But this is getting very meta. I mean, oh, yeah, you know, we're getting sure. back to uh, comedy podcasts. So, I mean, I think Todd Glass is an absolute master at this, where he's, what he's saying is funny, but then he's actually commenting on how he's delivering the joke. Yeah. This is the DC improv. Is Go ahead. Is the DC improv? Yes, it is. Go ahead. What do you have a question for the Todd Glass show? Did I get the right number? Yes, you did. You're calling the DC improv. Is this the DC improv? Yes, Hello? it is. Go ahead, DC improv. Hello? What if I was that dumb? What host of a show would put up with a moron caller? DC improv, go ahead. You're on the air. Hello? Yes, go ahead. He's destructing, I mean, he's uh, yeah, yeah. deconstructing it in real time. Yeah. So it's, it's like he's uh, existing on, like, there's like two planes of existence well, with com- a joke. Mm-hmm. Comedy it's is really divine bizarre. tragedy. Divine yeah. tragedy, yeah. yeah. Is there a comedy gene? Is it is it is it within everyone to every person alive to be a comedian, or is there a person? Are there some people who are just born to be comedians? I, I don't know, man. I mean, it would seem that there is. You know, there would seem to be natural to a lot of people. Um, but you would be surprised how many good comedians are not that funny off stage, and how many funny people, you know, at work or or amongst the friends, aren't that good. At, on stage because it's a discipline you know it's like a lot of it's it, it is very technical you know it is there's a lot of um you know i think there's uh there's a passion that goes into it see this is something i can attest to uh-huh. as it, cause getting into music because ryan and i were in a band together I, I i have found that most musicians really come alive on stage this is what they live for 
Yeah. Um, I am the opposite. I come alive during the creative process. Oh, I'm the same way. I like yeah. to create. I like to record. I like to listen. But actually playing live does absolutely nothing for me i feel like a yes. human, human jukebox <laughs> and so i'm constantly you know and you know this when we were absolutely. in the band together yeah, yeah. We, you and i were constantly changing up things just to keep ourselves interested right the guy that's funny with his friends you put him on stage he falls flat yeah he's not able for some reason it's it's like a chemical reaction yeah, once yeah. you get on stage either you are able to project and expand your personality and engage with the audience and there's a connection that happens or, or or it doesn't. If you just know somebody who is funny, it, it, it's a case to where maybe the maybe it's a situational sort of thing. It's not like the person can, hey, tell me a joke. You know, I heard you're a funny guy. Tell me a joke. Uh, it's like, it's, it's the like, context. It's yeah. like performing yeah. on uh, performing on demand. You know, like we were. It's, it's sort of like what we were. It's what we what we deal with every day is graphic designers, and also what we were talking about is as an artist. Um, you know, as a graphic designer, you know we're we're called to be creative on demand. Versus when we are in our spare time, we're just we're just drawing and being creative, and yeah. it can flow. It just it it presents itself when it presents itself. But then it, when it's when you're actually when you're doing it as a profession, you you have to do it. You have to say, I need it now. Show up. So inspirado. I mean, that's the yes. big question. Yeah. So um, there's this Onion article that says, uh, find something you love and do it on nights and weekends, right? <laughs> um, and that. Uh, there's this documentary about fish, and I, I, I feel like fish is, is what I like to call a 40-60 band, you know? And there's certain 40-60 bands. I would say Tom Waits, although Lane, I know, I know you would say that he is a, like a higher, you, uh, you know, it's more like Sacrilege. 100-100. A lot of my favorite bands, Tragically Hip, uh, these, these bands like don't really know what they do best, and because yeah. 60% of their stuff is so out there, experimental, it's almost like unlistenable. And then forty percent of it is nuggets. I mean, actual diamonds in the rough. And so, and, and of course, that you can move the lines on that um, mathematic map back and forth. But you know, you would argue, I, you know, fish, fish to me is an example of a band that doesn't really know what it does best. And of course, it's this is the A game conversation we've had <laughs> yeah. many times. Right. Okay. On this, I get, uh, I, I, I don't want to, I, w- I don't want to broach it if it's, uh, if it's old hat. It's a sensitive well, wait, subject. But wait a minute, but wait a minute. I, well, um, the part we'd always talk about is that I always, I think that whole A-game, I think the A-game thing is it's it's very subjective. I mean, it's like, you know, depends. What's and I goal, don't. What's the goal of it? I don't, I don't think, think it's that, subjective. I don't think there's absolute A-game. I think it's about, well, what is it? The A-game changes depending on what you're doing. It depends it depends on your audience. And, and it, it, uh, it might be somebody from the outside might perceive it. Oh, that's your A-game. But you might not feel it's your A-game. It might not be something you connect to as much. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, that's right. So, Maybe you're good at something that, but if if you're good at something, but you well, don't enjoy but, it, what's the so point? There's a technical thing. So there's having fun, and then there's being technically good. So like Lane, so we we were in a band, and um, like I think you know you had um, sort of like uh, Jeff and Pat on the one end of like the performance, like more having fun in the moment. There was kind of like almost like a spiritual mm-hmm. awakening when you're performing live, and and maybe even Jer, and then. Me That's was like Jeremiah. a little bit in the middle. I, ha- I, you know, I, it is kind of fun, but I really don't love performing live. Even with my current band, Ronald Reagan, the actor. Ronald Reagan, the actor. <laughs> I love when we're writing the music, and 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 practicing even. But performing live is is I really want to get it right. Like I'm not. It's supposed to be a spiritual experience for the for the audience or whatever. You know what I mean? Not to get like highfalutin about it, but like for for if I'm attempting to 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 bring some type of performance that I want to go a certain way. I think like, you know, you and I would be less interested in like if like a certain something technical didn't work like a pedal or something, we would just be like we have to skip the song because it's going to it's not going to be, you know, <laughs> it might be still fun to do it, but it's not going to sound good and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So, I saw this documentary about Fish, uh Bittersweet Hotel, I believe. And uh he's he's talking about um he's, he's talking to the camera and he goes um, I'll, I'll try not to impersonate him as if to make, you know, mockingly, but, you know, he, he basically said, like, I don't really mind when I mess up the notes or I don't do the chord progressions right. It's all about feeling the energy in the moment with the crowd and stuff like that. And so this is really the, the, the heart and soul of my problem with Fish. I mean, I saw Fish live and it was one of the worst things I've ever seen. You know what I mean? And I love some of their albums beyond all measure. I mean, one of their albums is probably my favorite rock album of all time, you know, and and I cannot, I cannot, like, when you go to see it live, it's almost like, 
I don't want to be like, yeah, you almost have to be on drugs to to appreciate it. Like, I get what they're going for. Like, it's discordant, and then there's a few minutes, a few moments where it comes together. And if you're still paying attention, yes, it does have this uh, uh, affecting um, almost, you know, like uh, like if you're still in it, it can be a heightened moment of of sonic sensation. But if you're not going along with them the whole way. If i.e. if you're not like already obsessed with whatever they're doing from day one, it's like hard to follow, man, and I just don't dig it. That's like so. the kind of ki- kind of thing King Crimson does a lot, where they mm-hmm. do where they do all these fancy time signatures, yeah. where you're, each each member of the band will be playing in something, but then at some point it's worked out in such a way to where maybe for like a few look for like about ten seconds they're all playing together, but then right. it kind of like spins they're another all off. they're another sixty forty Primus is probably yeah. my favorite example. Who you know Primus is like like that's like. Oh man, some of their stuff is just unlistenable. Like, who thinks of this? And then some of the other stuff is absolutely mind expanding. And you're like, who thinks of this? You know what I mean? But uh, so that's that's basically the big the question: performance. Like, performance is a discipline. You know what I mean? Whereas creating in the studio during a jam session, you know, practicing that can be that's a discipline as well. It's it, just a different. Uh, it's a different type it's of a discipline. Different animal, like, yeah. it's a more you're able to be more in the moment. Also, you know, getting back to what we our structure was that there needs to be some conformity on behalf of some musician within the group, so the audience can recognize that they're listening to music as opposed to an experimental, you know, right. noise, you know, explosion. That that really fell on on you and I. We needed to concentrate on the technical and. Uh, you know, we needed to be precise with uh, what we were doing. We we were pr- pr- uh, providing the foundation for them to indulge. Well, I think yeah, that's the it's, way. That's that's probably true. But I mean, when you put it like that, I mean, it's not. It's, but I don't like mean it as a criticism. Sure. I'm just saying it, it was implicit in the deal we made as musicians that someone needs to you know lay the foundation, and then other people right. can be more expressive and and provide the performance aspect. You're you're right. But here's here's. The the thing that you're getting at now is the argument that I have with my wife about the dishes. So <laughs> nice. my wife now, my wife my wife My wife. Uh who who I get along with great and I almost never fight with and I love, I love very you, much. I love you, baby. Um I don't sleep on the couch tonight. Sometimes <laughs> so it, it should come as a surprise to no one, you know, listening or that knows me or maybe even is just hearing my voice, that like I generally don't give a shit if the dishes are in the sink or like piling up for for days on it. Because you're a man. So in fact we're surrounded by dishes right so, now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, careful there, though, Jerry. Uh, so no, but and and my wife being um a neat woman. This is my wife. Mm-hmm. You know, and this isn't this isn't like rare to say. You know, this isn't <laughs> going to shock anyone that my wife is neat and I'm a slob. You know, so my wife goes. You know, I'm the only one that does the dishes. I'm the only one that gets around to this, and the responsibility seems to be implicitly on me. And you're right when you say that. You, she you, she's not wrong. However, in a live performance, you and me to a certain extent, but you were probably you know I. Like I was probably a bridge between those two yes, disciplines. Yeah. But but you and rightfully so, I would I think, were the only one that really cared about that. So you did that because you had the incentive to where they didn't have the incentive to. So when you when you when you phrase it like that, no one demanded that you come slug out the backbone of these songs. And I don't, just I don't volunteered to. Right. You know? That's what I'm saying. So, it's it's a bargain that is yeah. made and understood. It, it's it's really just the needs are being met with within right. you know each other. And, and that's, that's chemistry. All. And that's, that's chemistry. That's chemistry. Right. So right. that's chemistry. But I, you know, I feel like there can be like a uh, a sense of when you when you use language like they were free to indulge, where we had to do like the technical work. It's not like you or, or even me to as much an extent would have really wanted to, you know, go crazy no. on our instruments. Oh, I would. Yeah. No, I did want no, to, come on. but I'm not. No, but I'm. What I'm saying is, I'm not really. You know, wired that way. Yeah. Well, there's a performance. So there's performance and writing and creation are are just so different. We'll return after these messages. In a world gone mad, where the creative impulse had died, three men, a scholar, a warrior, and a cartoonist, banded together to stand tall in the face of creative tyranny. Prepare for the adventure of a lifetime. The Creative Impulse Podcast. One of the things we were talking about around the way over was that how, well, particularly Jerry and I are guys who we know specifically the specific, vi- the creative venue that we want to pursue. We want, we're, we're, we're both into comics and not so much that it's about comics, but that we've chosen this one thing where you guys seem like 
you guys are both very exploratory. Uh-huh. And it, and it's funny how and Lane and I have a lot you're, of You're mono creative. Is that what you're saying? Oh no, you did. It sounds so, der- it sounds Ooh, so derogatory. Oh, but if we say monolithic, we're poly, we're poly monolithic. Cre- monolithic. We're poly creative. Uh, <laughs> no, I think we're poly creative. Po- oh, you got I'm sorry. You're we, poly we are you're, the you're uni. Maps. You uh, are the monoliths. Well, we can't all be musicians. <laughs> Look, I mean, we could we could spin the language to make us all sound like geniuses. We're the polymaths. You're the monolith. Uh, there you go. But anyway, you know what what makes that like? Why is you know? It's funny how we talk about all this all the time. How you know? There's there's some point in our lives that Jerry and I decided. You know, this is the thing we want to focus on. Whereas yeah. you guys were guys are exploring. Not that there's any. I guess there's pros and cons of both. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But it's kind That's of funny. Say. It's kind of funny how that happens. How you, you know? Sometimes <laughs> you kind of we you link into something. I mean, sometimes we. Arguably, it's sometimes we argue that it's the medium that, like, I'm hooked to the medium of comics or the medium of drawing, and sometimes it's, it's you know, I see it as there was a particular story I wanted to tell or or, or or something I wanted to say, and this was the best way to do it, and I'm obsessed with that, and I'm driven to do it, and I'm also not rich, so it takes time. He, but you committed to a medium. I did, I did to an extent. All right, well, let me put it this one. I'm. I I wouldn't say I would commit it to one medium. There, are, I've worked in a few other mediums. You know, I've done. You know, but I, you know, drawing, you know, with uh, 3D and so forth. But, but, uh, but I, I guess for the time, I, I guess I, I cut some of the other ones back and, and kind of focused in on more and more, at least for the time being. But I hate to say that I'm so totally. What basically, we're describing is the difference between uh, a sense of passion and a sense of discovery. Ah. So, so you and Jerry are very passionate about what you're doing. Yeah. And Lane and I are more interested in like a nonstop life of discovery. In you know, as much as you can have one, mm. being having like a day job and being you know owning a home mm-hmm. and all this other stuff. I think that's fair. Yeah. So, yeah. so the uh, you know that's now <laughs> there are certainly moments of you know passion in these these things we do. There's bubbles, mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. that. Uh, but just none of them have led to. I think that when you do like like telling jokes on stage, you know, when I was working at the comedy club in college, I would kind of hate it, man. I was like Roger Waters on tour, just like can't wait for this tour to be over. And when I compare myself to Roger Waters, I just mean in hating parts of doing his job, not in the genius mm. sense. But you know what I mean. <laughs> you know, I just I just thought of something. Something popped in my head. You know, one thing I think that's important about being an artist, it's not just about the the technical the quality. I think confidence plays a big part of being an artist. Um, the reason I say that is that, uh, you know, when I, when you, when you, someone said to me recently, he was watching me draw, and I said, uh, he said, you, uh, you, you're funny because you just draw. You don't take time to find your lines. You just kind of just make a line and go with it. And, and I think that's, that's, yeah. I guess that's, that's confidence. It's that you, you make a mark or you, or you, you make, you, you create something and you go with it. And, yeah. and, and sometimes I think part of art is that part of doing something creative is that, so you believe it, and then everybody else around you starts believing it too. So you come up with a unique idea, and it's not just the fact that it's good; it's the fact that you believe it's good, and the, and so so it kind of on some level it that 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 confidence that that belief that faith that you have in it registers in other people. A sense of confidence can certainly be infectious, but you have to be kind of a virtuoso, and that's where the comedy thing comes in. Mm. If some guy comes on stage, Eddie Murphy and like these great comics of the '80s would come on and be like on the stage and be like, "I'm the shit," and everyone would be like, "He's kind of he's kind of right." But today, that doesn't fly a lot of times. Mm. You have to really be the shit, and, or otherwise they're like, "This guy's you know this guy's just loud," you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and that's why that's why like self-deprecating comedy. Um, I don't want to like the Louis C.K. thing. It's it's kind of easier to do what Louis C.K. does because all you have to do is admit it's just be completely honest and admit like I'm so not the shit and most of the audience will relate to that because they're not the shit either. But you have to be fearless, I think, to oh, yeah, be able yeah. to admit it's, that. I don't think it's, it's easy. I'm not. You're saying it's technically, it's technically easy. easy. Oh. It's not easy emotionally to do that. Like you have to really shit on your dignity. You know what I mean? Does, so it's like well, I, I one, think I think one of the things about Eddie Murphy is that he just likes to party all the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, it's his girl who likes to party all the time. <laughs> this was his problem. To his point, though, and Dave and I have been talking about this a lot late, lately. Have you seen uh, what is it? True, De- True Detective. Oh, yeah, we just yeah, we just finished. Show. Okay, love that. Show. Uh, I loved it too. But it's unreal. There's one line that haunts me. This fits in the context of what we were talking about earlier. Life's barely long enough to get good at one thing. Right. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This I feel that more. Yeah, this yeah. this was killed me because yeah. of the type of creative individual I am. 
but I'd like to experiment with a lot of different things. You know, so this is this is like the crux here of what Dave and I talk about. There's a there's a phrase, you know, learn to. It's, I, I don't know who said this, but it, the, the essence of it is learn to mourn for the roads not taken. Oh yeah. So make the choice, yeah, yeah. commit, and and move on. You just mourn. Yeah. You know, remember remember one one an addendum to that. Remember the uh, you know we often we talk about. The that solution to that to that feeling that you know that I that desire to explore all these things maybe that says that you know we were talking about maybe that means that you need to take get a high you know take a higher ground in the creative in the creative process maybe you're not maybe it's not so much that you're on the ground making you know work, engaged with the specific working with a specific medium but maybe you're you're dealing with the big picture you know you're you're an art director a creative director a producer some sort of you know more executive role i mean is that maybe that's a place for people like you guys people with issues like yours who are weird <laughs> wait, wait, wait. i'm just messing with you so, no no that's fine how <laughs> dare no, 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 that's you fine. Wait, so what are you saying is that we should be your boss I'm not I think that, that is what I'm, he's saying. Oh, hold on, I'm not. I'm not saying that. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, there's a quote by Primus guitarist Larry Lalonde, who I got to interview, was one of like mind blowing hero worship interview moments for me. Primus sucks. Um, he was talking about the creative process, and I'm going to paraphrase this because I said something like, "You guys, the latest record has kind of this sense of like almost like." psychedelic ska like you know it was like a progressive ska metal or something and he goes and he said something to the effect to the effect of and I'll, I'll butcher it but uh he said he goes yeah we don't we're not terribly fascinated with trying to do things that have been done before mm -hmm. and 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 i totally got that because that's you know trying to explore that unprecedented territory unless i'm gonna be the best new trumpet player or you know uh cartoonist or, or 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 you know have a have the single best podcast ever like i don't have as much incentive unless it's really fun you know what i mean i don't have the same incentive to try and do it as something that is like a, an entirely new discovery tcip brought to you by the blood of your ancestors are you worthy <laughs> oh!